Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to my uh, dissertation defense. Uh, I really appreciate your coming. Uh, so first, uh, my name is uh, Wenbo Wang. So I'm a PhD student uh, at uh, Noisy Center. Um, so uh, my advisor is, uh, <coughs> you guys already knew who was my, who's my advisor, right? So, <laughs> OK, so Dr. Amit Shet. Uh, so my committee members are Dr. KK Chen here. Uh, Kevin Hess from Microsoft, so he's joining uh, from uh, Google Hangout. And uh, Dr. TK Prasad uh, sitting here. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ramakant Kavaluru, so who is joining uh, through a Google Hangout. So today uh, <coughs> uh, I'll talk about emotion identification from text. So for emotion, you know, every day there are different types of emotions just now, you know, uh, you guys have seen different types of emotions, you know, maybe this one or <laughs> maybe this one, <laughs> right? So, you know, different types of emotions. Basically, to summarize, so our emotions are the slaves to our thoughts, right? And we are the slaves to our emotions. So what does this mean? So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34. 35. So there are 35 slaves, you know, in this room, right? We are the slave to our emotions. So, okay. <clears throat> so emotions are very important. So give an example. So in 2013, uh, there was, uh, you know, stock, stock market crash. So S&P 500 dropped by 1%. <coughs> and what happened? Because on that day, there was a fake tweet saying uh, two explosions in the White House. Uh, Barack Obama was, uh, is injured, right? So because of this uh, fake tweet from uh, Associated Press, and there was a fear spreading in the market. And you know, on that day, you know, it just, and not on that day, just within a couple of minutes, you know, it dropped by 1%. So this is a fear emotion. So this is for the stock market, right? So when it comes to uh, employee productivity, emotions also play a very important role. So happier you know, uh, employees, you know, they are more productive. So you know, uh, but if you are not, if you are a sad you know, employee, uh, you know, it, it will be the opposite. So besides the employee pro uh, productivity, so let's take a look at our you know, own well-being. So for us, right, when it comes to our uh, physical condition, you know, if, if you feel something, hey, it's wrong with, with my heart, what you will do is you will get an ECG checkup, right? Then you will be able to see these, uh, you know, these curves here to see whether you, know, you are all right or not, right? So when, when it comes to our own emotional state, right, are you happy or not? If we were able to, you know, uh, identify our happiness, right? We can draw something called happiness index. So we can see that: Are you happy right now? Or are you feeling sad? Or, you know, are you feeling nervous? Or, how long have you been, you know, suffering from uh, depression? Or how long have you been in the peak state? Probably suggesting that, you know, you're in love or something, you know. So, okay. So to identify emotions, right? Uh, we can identify from photos, or we can identify emotions from text. So take a look at the example. This is a Facebook post uh, from myself because I have the copyright. So uh, this is how we find time to do workout, feeling great. Uh, you know. So we were doing some push-ups uh, in our own lab. So that is why you can see that you know, I was pretty happy uh, you know, at that time. So this is a happy emotion. So besides the uh, Facebook post, so we, what we can also do is to say identify emotions from uh, you know, tweets. So this lady, uh, she was about to get uh, get married in 48 hours, so nervous level, approaching first day of school. So that lady was pretty nervous, right? So what was interesting was I found the, the, the reply to her tweet. So the, the reply was like this, uh, pack some snacks and everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. So I got inspired. So yesterday night, uh, Lou and I, we went to Meyer. So that is why I purchased a lot of snacks outside, <laughs> just for you guys and for me. So, okay. So I'll give you motivations why, why, you know, why should I you know, work on emotion identification, right? So now the question is, okay, what is, what is emotion? What is emotion identification? So emotion is a strong feeling, right? It can be you know, love, anger, uh, joy, uh, sadness, so different types of emotions. And then what is uh, emotion identification? So emotion identification is we want to identify the person's emotion uh, from, the, it is, uh, uh, from the person's text. So to give some examples, so here, uh, I hate when my mom compares me to my friends. So this is uh, anger, right? Uh, when I see a cop, no matter where I am or what I'm doing, I always feel 
every law I have broken is stamped all over my body. So this is uh, emotion fear. Okay, so that is this is what I want to do. Uh, you know, uh, in my uh, defense. So uh, specifically, I propose to study three questions. So the first one is okay. How do I glean people's emotions from their text using machine learning techniques? So that is the first question. So the second question is since I you know apply you know uh, supervised machine learning techniques to uh, to tackle the problem. So it involves uh, training data. So the second question is how do I automatically create a large amount of training data from social media? So this is the second question. So the third question is after. After you know collecting such a large amount of uh, self labor emotion data from social media, how do I leverage such a data set to improve emotion identification in other domains such as blogs or fairy tales? So basically, these are the three questions. And uh, for the first two questions, because I already covered them uh, in my uh, prospectors, so I will just briefly you know mention the, the first two questions, and uh, I will, you know especially focus on uh, the third question uh, today. So the first one is uh, emotion classification. So for emotion classification, uh, so for emotion classification, uh, you know what we do is, uh, so that we have the the input data here, and then we apply the feature extractor extract features. So we use features to represent each sentence, and then we feed these uh, feature vectors into the machine learning algorithms so that. We can train a classified model out of the you know the algorithm, and once we have such a model, next time when I have a new uh, a sentence or new tweet coming, and then I apply feature extractor, use features to represent them, and then the classified model would you know make a prediction. So that that is how it works. So you can see that uh, the way how we uh, choose features to represent the sentence plays an important role. So that is why uh, I will show specifically w which features did I uh, explore to represent you know, these sentences. So before that, I will talk about you know, the data set. So here, there are two data sets. One is uh, suicide notes. So this one was manually uh, labeled. So uh, a second one is uh, Twitter data, so which I will talk about uh, in details how do I automatically create such a data set. So for the first one, it covers 15 fungrain emotions. And uh, we have uh, more than uh, 4,000 sentences. And we have uh, 2,000 uh, sentences for testing purpose. For Twitter data, we have uh, seven emotions, about 250,000 for training purpose, about uh, 250,000 tweets for testing purpose. So let's look at the first data set. So for suicide notes, uh, so we try different features. So the first category is uh, ngram features. So for ngram features, so if you, if you look at this sentence example, this is super cool. I passed my math star test, right? So unigram would be the, each individual words here, and backgrounds would be two consecutive words here. Okay, so based on the experiment on this data set, we find that the combination of unigrams and backgrounds performs the best among all the ngram features. So then, when we move to the knowledge-based features here, so let me give you one example. This is LIWC. So it contains different you know emotion categories, and for each category, it has a bunch of words associated with different categories. So in this sentence, because we see uh, super, we see cool. And these two you know, are associated with the positive emotion. So that is why uh, for this category, you know, this feature would be two. So by adding the knowledge-based features, you know, we can further increase the performance. And the third one is uh, syntactic features. So for syntactic features, we try the part of speech count. And we also try the sentence tense. So part of speech count would be you know, how many adjectives do we have here, how many nouns do we have here, etc. For sentence tense, so we say, okay, this is, this is super, so this is a simple present tense. And we have simple past tense, I passed, right? So this is how we uh, obtain the syntactic features. So by adding the syntactic features, uh, we can further increase you know, the performance. <coughs> so this is for the suicide notes uh, data set. So now let's move to the next one, which would be the Twitter data set. So first, let's compare you know, using only <coughs> adjectives and using un, uh, ungram, uh, unigrams. Right? So you can see there's a huge gap between using only adjectives and uh, unigrams. Why is that? Because emotions sometimes can be expressed you know, uh, implicitly. I'm always say, I don't usually always say, oh, I'm nervous, I'm happy, I'm joy, uh, I'm joyful. Right? So there are different ways to convey emotions. Sometimes you describe a situation. So I say, oh, I'm, uh, I'm getting married you know, uh, tomorrow. So, in your mind, you, you think, okay, I will probably be happy, 
And I also probably a little bit nervous, right? So I didn't say express any adjectives uh, explicitly. So that is the difference. So similarly, uh, you know, apply the the combination of unigrams and bigrams, you know, achieves a very good uh, base performance here. And uh, when we keep adding uh, the knowledge-based features uh, here and uh, part of speech tags, so then the performance doesn't increase much from uh, from here to here because we uh, the size of the training data is two, about 250,000 tweets. So we already have a very large training data. So that is why the, the role of the knowledge, knowledge features becomes uh, less important. OK, so now uh, we have just, uh, I have just shown you that you know, which features uh, you know, perform uh, well on different data sets. So now you can see that for the second data set is Twitter. Uh, we have about 200 and uh, we have a, you know, a, a, it's much larger compared with the first uh, data set, right? So, so in emotion identification, the challenge here is actually how do we uh, obtain you know, the training data and why is that? Because for emotion identification, uh, it is a multi-class classification. So usually it involves at least six, seven different types of emotions. So if you need to annotate the data set, right, it's not just binary, you, know, it's, you label it positive and negative. So you need to choose one emotion out of you know, six, seven different emotions. So that is one thing. A second thing is uh, for diff emotions are subjective. So something for the same uh, emotion situations, maybe one person you know, has one emotional response, the other one has a different one. So that is why it is a little bit tricky. So because of these reasons, uh, most of the existing uh, data sets are relatively small. So you can see for the blog, so most of them they are just at the, the, the level of uh, thousands of uh, labeled uh, sentences. So that is the situation. But however, we really need a large uh, training data. So why is that? So in 2001, uh, Banco and Brio, so they performed a very interesting study. So at that time, they picked up a bunch of uh, state-of-the-art classifiers. And they were trying to figure out, hey, you know, which one works the best? So if you look at the x-axis, that will be the size of the training data. The y-axis will be the performance. Okay? So initially, if you just have a small amount of a training data, you can see that the performance uh, among different classifiers, right? there's a you know, big difference here. But as we keep increasing the size of the training data, you can see the difference becomes smaller and smaller in the end. Okay? So that is why they concluded that uh, we want to make a balance uh, between spending time uh, and uh, money uh, working on you know, algorithm development versus the corpus development. So this, this uh, you know, plot clearly shows that the importance of you know, using a large amount of uh, training data. So now when we switch to emotion identification, right? so why do we need this, uh, you know, a large amount of uh, training data? Because there are just different emotion situations in our daily life. So if you look at these examples, uh, so this one, I hate it when my mom compares me to my friends. So you have seen this one, see a cough, or uh, get the hiccups in class, right? And this one, fit into one pair of my jeans. And the last one, a dog uh, barked at me. So there are just so many different types of emotion situation, e situations in our daily life. So if we want to be able to identify emotions, we really need a large corpus that can capture you know, different emotion situations, right? So how do we do that? So, I noticed that on Twitter, people use hashtags to uh, tag each tweet. So all of the, so these all of these tweets, right? They are original tweets from Twitter. I didn't make any changes. So you can see that. <coughs> so what people what is happening is first people de describe what happened, then they will put the emotion hashtag at the end to to you know to to summarize their emotion, right? So you can see by using this approach. So what we can do is, uh, so first, uh, you know, we can use this uh, emotion hashtag to collect the data. Right? And then once we have the data from the uh, emotion hashtag, we can infer the corresponding emotion. Once we have the emotion, we can use that as a label. Right? And then we can remove the emotion hashtag from the tweet. So that is how we can, yes. So given that there is a sufficient large, uh, sufficiently large corpus, um, it's possible that a dog bark at me would be hashtag scared, but also it could be hashtag uh, annoyed. Yes. Um, I could be also hashtag um, angry because you had already talk, told your neighbor that you know your dog is uh, painful and you need to handle that, and then he's not doing it, so now you're angry. Right? Yes, yes. So the point is that there may be a variety of emotions that may actually occur. Yes. Um, and then, of course, the, you know the classifier we pick up, which is a predominant one in this case, right? Yes, yes. But 
you know, it maybe it is that it, the whole form, whole aspect of context would be lost. Mm -hmm. So if one person was let's say timid, mm -hmm. and another person was gung ho, a very you know macho guy. Mm -hmm. For the same situation, they will routinely react differently. As an example, right? Yes. Right. And um, any you know, you train your classifier in a very large corpus, it's still not going to be able to personalize it. Anybody, oh, I saw that. No. Has anybody done? Have you thought about it? Has anybody else thought about that kind of stuff? Because the emotion um, can be you know, you know, people would use the things express express different languages, uh, use different languages to express the same emotion. Or you know would uh, you know react to the same uh, incidences with different emotions. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And that personalization, contextual also aspect is um, interesting if you want to really get very good results. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And of course, your objective is to get one singular thing. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Have right. you seen any work of that kind? No, right now no. Because uh, right now is because it usually involves six, seven different types of emotions, right? Mm -hmm. So to get the results on, at, you know, such a for the multi-class classification, it's already difficult. So I think it will be very interesting, but I think that will be probably uh, next next steps. So yeah. Okay. Okay. So okay. So I was uh, saying, uh, you know, we can leverage the uh, emotion hashtags. Uh, on Twitter, I use the, this one to infer people's emotions, right? And then we can remove the emotion hashtag from the from the tweet. So then we get the input center, input tweet and the corresponding label for training purpose. So I will talk about this is what I plan to talk about in the second part: uh, how to create a self-labeled data set for emotion identification. So what I did was uh, I read the famous uh, psychology uh, psychology literature. So I collected, you know. Uh, different words for seven different types of emotions. And then I put hashtags uh, you know, in front of each word. And then I used, uh, in total, I used 131 uh, emotion hashtags to filter the Twitter uh, real-time stream. So in six weeks, I collected about uh, 5 million tweets. So once I collect such tweets, then I designed some heuristics to you know, further improve the quality of the data set. So if you look at the second tweet, right? So hashtag happy. Okay, so there is no context about you know what is happening, right? So we, we can remove this one. For the third one, this hashtag happy, then uh, a link to a picture, right? So because I want to focus on the the, the text, identifying emotions from text, so this clearly is not you know uh, should not in, in my data set. So I perform the the filtering, and from five million tweets, I get about two point five million tweets remaining. So uh, that is the filtering part. So once after the filtering part, I have about uh, two point five million tweets. And out of them, I uh, selected uh, 250,000 tweets for testing. And then I used the remaining for training purpose. So now I will start showing you uh, what is the importance you know, of uh, the size of the training data. <coughs> so for this plot, so the x-axis would be the number of tweets in the training data. The y-axis would be the accuracy. I applied two classifiers. So one is a logistic regression. And the other one is multinomial naive base. Why are you not going all the way to 2.488 million? Oh, that is why. Uh, yeah, that, this is a good question. So the reason why is so you notice that uh, this is about uh, let me see uh, 0.5 million tweets uh, short, right? So the reason is uh, about two, 250,000 were used for testing, and there is another 200, 250,000 tweets were used for development. So that is why. I have a question on yes. the position. If you go back uh, to your previous slide, so Dave, do you have that emotion hashtag is not at the end? That also is a heuristic. Person uh, can also express emotion uh, like when he's like, describing the thing in the sentence and then use the hashtag, right? Mm -hmm. So, like those cases, I mean, why you chose this as compared to also having those cases? Right, yeah, this is a good question. Uh, so. Based on my observation, so the emotion attack, they can occur say at the beginning, uh, in the middle, or at the end, right? So based on my observation is that if it occurs at the end, then the quality would be the highest. So in my case, because my objective is to uh, to do things automatically, since I can you know collect such a large amount of tweets every day, right? So I don't care about losing some tweets, but I want because if I want to say obtain uh, the the tweet, say if the emotion attack is at the very beginning, let's say if let's assume say if the precision is. Uh, 60%, right? Then I need to come up, okay, how do I you know, deal with the 
present false positive ones. So that would be a problem. So that is the main reason. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Kevin and uh, Rama, do you have any questions so far? Uh, yes. So can you go back to slide number? Uh, Rama, can you say the slide, uh, slide number again? 1919. Yes. So why are you saying that knowledge features, um, features become less important? Oh, so if you look at the uh, row number, so basically I'm saying this because if you look at the row number 5 and the row number 12, right? So the difference is I add the knowledge-based features and uh, you know, part of speech, uh, features on top of the row five. So you can see the performance increment is from, uh, for naive base is from uh, 61.13 uh, to 61.15. So you can see the, the increment is, uh, is uh, limited. So that is why I say uh, it becomes uh, less important. Right, so I noticed the difference, but why do you believe that it's happening? The reason, why are they not helping? Um, for, for, I mean, why do you say that? Why do you believe that it's happening when the website is not? Uh, so, so when the when the dataset is uh, is is uh, small, right? So in that case, the dataset basically. So if you how how do I put it? So let's say if we think about the uh, all the different uh, emotion situations as a, as a space, right? So the, the, these uh, instances would be we are trying to fill in these spaces. So if the data is small, so we can probably cover some corners or you know, some rooms, right? But we won't be able to cover you know, a, a large space. So that is in, that, in, the, in such cases, if we have the knowledge-based features, we can guide the classifier and say, oh, OK, uh, it's OK that if the instance doesn't cover uh, this case, but the knowledge-based the knowledge will tell you, say, if, if, uh, if you see this word and this word, you know, usually it, 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 it uh, indicates certain emotion. But when, when we have, say, 200, 250,000 tweets, right? So then in that case, we can cover probably a lot more, uh, you know, the, the, the problem space. So in that case, whatever the knowledge base can cover, most of them can be covered by the, uh, the large amount of data, too. So that is why what I mean, say, it, uh, they become less important on Twitter data. OK, so um, but with this accuracy, right? If you, by accuracy, do you actually mean accuracy, or do you uh, uh, can you repeat your question? Uh, is this a score or is this accuracy? Because it, those two are different. It is accuracy. Okay. So it's, it, it still shows that you're getting 40% of the data, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so have you done any qualitative error analysis to see if there are uh, classes of errors that you can easily capture with specific tools or specific ways of actually using knowledge bases? Uh, yeah, this is a good question. So I didn't look at I, I look at the overall accuracy, but I didn't look at the each specific class. Okay, so that that could be very important, right? I, I think this is really an iterative process mm -hmm. where you first run your base model and you don't stop there. You actually go look at the confusion matrix, look at all the error classes, and see if there are errors that are predominantly occurring frequently and that maybe there are heuristics that you can use to uh, actually address them. The reason why yes, I'm saying yes. this is um, I know you're, work, you're interested in working in an industry setting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, everybody knows that you know uh, applying base models is not going to work. Yes. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're looking at uh, people working, uh, participating in uh, sentiment analysis, challenges, and competitions, if you look at their actual system uh, description or white paper, you will see that they are doing a lot of tweaking based on error analysis of their initial model. So yes, you yes. probably want to do that in the future. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think this is a really good idea. Okay, that is all I have. Okay, okay. Uh, Kevin, do you have any questions so far? Seems I cannot hear Kevin, so let me just switch to this. Uh, 
Uh, no, Kevin, I cannot hear you. Okay, let's continue. Uh, what do you want to do? Oh, uh, you ask questions on I am. Okay, uh, so back here, um, so, so for logistic regression, when we increase the size of the training data from 1,000 to about 2 million, you can see that uh, the uh, performance gets increased from, uh, from this number to this number, and the percentage gain is uh, 51%. So for uh, multinomial naive bias, when we similarly, when we increase the size of training data from 1,000 to uh, about 2 million, right? So you can see uh, the performance increase from here to here, and the percentage gain is 38%. So from these two figures, you can see that you know the, clearly the importance of a large amount of uh, you know training data is really uh, very important. So this is just at the high level. So let's look at the uh, class uh, class specific you know performance. So the top three emotions: joy, sadness, and anger. So they consist about 60, uh, 70, 76% of the, the tweets. Right? So for them, you, know, you can see for their, uh, the, the minimum F measure is over 64%. So consider it's a, you know, we have seven different types of classes, so this is not bad. And for the, th uh, the following three uh, less popular emotions, love, fear, and thankfulness, so they consist of 22% uh, of the tweets. So their precisions are better compared with the, their recalls. And the F measure, the minimum one, is over 43%. So that is the result we get. Um, so, so far, what we have learned here is that we can collect a large amount of uh, self labor data with little efforts. And such a large amount of data, they cover different uh, emotion situations in our daily life. And the performance gain with the increasing size of the training data. So, however, we are able to collect a large amount of uh, you know, training data for Twitter domain, but how about other domains? So specifically, let's look at this one. So we took a random sample of uh, you know, 100,000 tweets from the previous uh, the collected Twitter data. So we have uh, you know, lots of uh, labeled tweets. But if you look at other domains, you can see that the number becomes uh, much less. So you may notice that these numbers are slightly uh, different from the numbers that I gave uh, uh, previously, because uh, for the emotion annotation, people follow different you know, uh, what do you say, uh, standards. So that is why I just took a, a, all the common emotion labels that were used. So that is why you know, the numbers become less. So now the challenge is, how do we you know, leverage the tweet to improve the emotion identification in target domains? So which brings the third part of my presentation today, which will be uh, domain adaptation for emotion identification. So first, uh, I would like to you know, properly define the problem. So the input will be a large amount of uh, self labor tweets. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we have a, a small amount of labor data in target domains, such as uh, blogs, uh, fairy tales, etc. So our objective here is we want to select informative tweets, and uh, then we want to add these informative tweets to the target domain labor data for training purpose. And then we train a new model such that the new model can perform better uh, in terms of uh, emotion identification in the target domain. So that is our objective. So first, uh, I will present the uh, bootstrapping framework. So for this framework, if you look at the top left, that is uh, you know, self labor tweets. And for the bottom, uh, uh, let me see, bottom left, this is a target domain uh, labor data. So you can see we have a lot more uh, you know, uh, instances uh, in, in a tweets data set. OK, so now the first step is uh, we train a classifier C on the target domain uh, labor data. That is the first step, so it's very easy. Uh, then we apply the classifier C to the tweets here. So now remember, for every tweet, right, we use the emotion hashtags to infer it is uh, label right, from the emotion hashtag. So it, has, it is one uh, original label for every tweet. And then when we apply the classifier C, then each classifier C will make a prediction label. Right? So if the original label and the predicted label, if, if they match, then we say that, okay, th these, tweet, you know, are, uh, these tweets are correctly classified. 
If they don't match, we say, OK, these tweets are misclassified. So now we divide all the tweets into two, two parts, cor correctly classified and misclassified. And then from the misclassified tweets, we try to identify informative tweets. And then we add these informative tweets into the target domain uh, label data. OK, so because this is a bootstrapping process, right? So once we finish this part, then we go back here. We train a new classifier C using the new training data. And then we apply C back to the tweets again. So this keeps going until we no longer find more informative tweets. Did not put all the correctly classified tweets there? Yes. Uh, yes, so now. There are six of them, but you show only five cats there. Oh, this is an iterative. Uh, you, are you talking about the correctly classified or yeah, the misclassified? OK, yeah, so you just brought you just brought, brought up my next step, right? So why select from misclassified tweets? So that I understand. Uh, okay. why you, but you use all the correctly classified tweets, right? No, I don't. You don't. Yeah. So okay. So so here uh, I want to uh, I want to explain why I don't select informative tweets from the correctly classified tweets, right? So the reason is like this. So the reason why the classifier uh, is able to identify you know this red cat, why? Because the classifier already seen you know similar th things, similar instances in the target domain label data, right? So what does this mean is uh, uh, this the knowledge contained in this you know red, red uh, in this red cast, right? It's already already exists in the target domain label data. That is why it, it can make the prediction uh, correctly. So if we add this correctly classified red cast into the target domain label data, then we are just you know duplicating the, the same knowledge again and again, right? So it won't help that much. However. The reason why the classifier was not able to, you know, say make correct prediction on this uh, red bird, why? Because this guy occurs, you know, once in the target domain label data, right? So the target domain is lacking such knowledge because it does contain a lot of such knowledge. So that is why, if if the target domain is lacking such knowledge, that is why I want to select, you know, such knowledge uh, contained by these by the red birds to complement the knowledge in the target domain. So that is why we want to select from the misclassified tweet. Yes. Did you remove the tweets? Yes. Uh, yeah. It was removed. Yes. Okay. How can you know that uh, if you reiterate with a new new target domain that label data, you now misclassify something that you had classified correctly before? Uh, so your question is, if I if I change the target domain label data, yes, probably you can uh, add some say entropy to your, your classification and you can misclassify something that you are classifying correctly before. Yes. So if you reinforce your knowledge, maybe you can find something like you can skip this passage like this. And I'm not sure you No, he, he, he does it iteratively, so. Yeah, that's why. Right. Yeah, so, 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 okay, so basically what he's saying that, so since I'm, you know, adding these informative tweets, right, so basically every time I'm changing the target domain lab, label data, by changing the label data, every time I train a different classifier, right? So if everything is done perfectly, then, you know, I keep increasing the performance. But however, what if, what if things go wrong slightly? I may misclassify some tweets in the target domain, right? So yes, that, that will happen. But for the, because the, the time is limited, so I didn't cover that part in the, in the presentation today. But I can, First. yes, there's a, there's a part in my uh, paper. So I'll talk to you uh, offline. Oh, so yes, yes. It will be, uh, it had been addressed. So okay. but I'm glad you, you found it out. So. OK, uh, so okay, so just now I ex explained why, uh, why I select informative tweets from misclassified tweets, right? But again, you, know, you guys may not believe me. So that is why <laughs> later in the experiments, so I, was, I will try three different experiments. So select informative tweets from misclassified tweets, OK? So that is one option. And select informative tweets from correctly classified uh, tweets. And select tweets from all the tweets, right? That would be the superset. So, so that you know, hopefully, you know, experiments can can show you know why uh, can justify why why I chose this way. So, uh, yes, Alan. Uh, briefly, what did you? How did you define informative in this context? Yes. So, <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. So, thank you for asking the question. So, naturally, it brings to my next slide. <laughs> so, okay. So, what is informativeness? So. So first, because this is a little bit complicated, right? So that's why I just first give you an overview, right? So I define informativeness as three parts. So consistency, diversity, and similarity. I will start explaining them you know, one by one to you guys, OK? So first, let's look at what do I mean by consistency. So consistency, look at this tweet. So it is label. We infer the label is a fear, because you can see, hopefully, tomorrow goes as planned, right? So that is the fear part comes from. 
But if you look at the first sentence, amazing night with my baby. So this one, this sentence expresses emotion joy. So you can see now we have uh, the emotion label, one emotion, that is fear. But in the tweet, it conveys two emotions, fear and joy, right? So you can see the label and content, now they are no, no longer consistent. So that is why I want to capture these. So we want to use the consistency to measure how much the, the label and the, the content is consistent. So basically, the larger the value, the better. That is, what, that, that is what I'm trying to do here, OK? So now, how do we mathematically you know, capture these? So, uh, so I, well, I will be iterating you know, each word in this tweet. And then I will try to spot the top supporting features for emotion fear. So the upper script S stands for this is a condition probability estimated from the, the source domain data, which is the tweet. And the upper script T stands for uh, this is a condition probability estimate using the target domain uh, label data. So you can see uh, for the emotion fear, hope is a very good feature, right? So according to the target domain test data, present yeah, is, uh, is not a good one, right? But that is what, the best we can get. So then we try to find the top supporting features for any emotion other than fear. So you can see uh, you know, tomorrow is a very good feature for joy. Night is a good feature for joy. OK, so now we find the top supporting features for, emotion, uh, for fear, top supporting features for any emotion other than fear. Right? So now what we do is we use the margin to estimate the consistency. I pick out the larger out of these two numbers. And then you get 0 0.5094. And then I get the larger out of uh, 0 0.5625 and uh, 0 0.5962. OK, so now I, I use the, the margin to estimate the, the consistency. You can see the margin is selective, right? So in this case, it, it clearly shows that it expresses a mix of emotions. So otherwise, what will happen is we'll have a very large value you know, here, but I have a small value here. So then we'll get a, a large consistency value. So that is, that is what I mean by uh, consistency. So that is the first part. Uh, then, yes. Uh, in the domain, uh, sorry, in other domains, right? Right. I saw you mentioning that it's more sentence level uh, training. Yes. Right. Uh, but you are you're here. You're taking the whole tweet as one sentence. Yes. So how would that differ? Yeah, this is a good question. So, so here I'm making an assumption that uh, each tweet is roughly you know one sentence. So I'm assuming that because Twitter it is very short, usually people just talk about you know focus on one thing uh, exclusively. But sometimes it may happen that they talk about several things or more than one thing. So and specifically in this, right? Like yes, the yes. First sentence would be thrown out, and right. the last sentence might have more relevancy yes. towards fear. Yes, yes, yes. Whatever the yeah fear. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah, it, it can happen, right? Mm -hmm. So that is why I, I want to use the consistency to you know to give low priority to these tweets. So. Yeah. So, uh, so the first one is consistency, then followed by uh, diversity. Yeah, that is what Twitter, to tweet data. Oh, it is a tweet data, this one. Why? Yeah, well, that's more than 142 characters. Uh, more than 140 characters. I, I think it's, it's a, let's count the number later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at math, so. Uh, no, I think uh, uh, on an average, uh, it, it's 14 words per tweet, mm -hmm. on an average. So it's around 16, 17. So, Fourteen is yeah stretching it, but I've read in a paper that on an average it's fourteen. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, let's focus on the diversity right uh, factor. So so now let's say we have a uh, two tweets. Uh, you know let's assume it's uh, less than uh, one hundred forty characters. So expressing the same emotion sadness here right. So in the first one you can see uh, this point is a very good feature for emotion sadness. And the for, for the second one, lose is a very good feature for emotion sadness, right? And we know that it's a point occurs uh, two times in the target domain data, and lose occurs 15 times, right? So now the question is, so say, if we, we were about to uh, choose one out of uh, these two to add, them, uh, to add it into the target domain training data, which one should we choose, right? So I would go for the first one. Why is that? Because the second one, the, this feature it already occurs 15 times. Right? It occurs very frequently, far more frequent than the first one in the target domain data. So there's a hi much higher chance that the classifier has picked up this sig signal for you know, identification. So that is why I want to you know, assign higher priority to the first sentence. Right? So how do I do that? So I, so I define the, the diversity as the exponential decay 
of the uh, the term frequency of the, the of this best feature, you know, here. So this is the exp exponential decay here. So it's a little bit uh, difficult to understand. So let's look at the, the figure here, right? So it's going to look like like this. So disappoint because it it occurs two times. So the the when we apply this formula, you know, we get 0 0.90. For lose, we get uh, 0 0.47, right? So in this case, you can see that we are assigning you know, higher priority to features uh, that is uh, infrequent or underrepresented in the target domain data. So that is, that is what I mean by you know, diversity, right? I want to uh, uh, promote the, 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 these underrepresented features. So that is the second part, uh, diversity part. Can you go? Yes. Uh, do you do that per class? Um, because it can also be, you know, frequent for the other class, right? But however, it may be. Yes, it, 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 it is for class. For class. Because for this one, I know it is labeled. Uh, but it's a tweet, right? Tweet has been labeled. So I know it is, uh, it is sadness. So I'm looking for the, the best feature supporting this, uh, this emotion. And then I get it is uh, term frequency. So, yes. What if it is for the other uh, um, class? Also, you know, it is that, I mean, the diversity for mm -hmm. we'll say for sadness mm -hmm. and also for let's say anger in anger also let's say disappointing so if that is the case the 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 consistency can so basically you, you are saying uh, what do you say uh, one feature can indicate two different emotions and there is no significant difference Right. So if that's the case, then the consistency can come in play. Right. Then the, the margin will be very small. So yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so okay. So this is a diversity. So then uh, let's look at the similarity. Right. So this one is um, inspired by uh, you know a domain adaptation for machine translation. So usually uh, what they do is say instead of using all the training data to train a model, then apply it to the testing data. They select a subset out of the all the training data. Uh, then train a model, then apply to the to the testing data. So such that the subset of the training data, right, they can match the testing data better because you know they are more similar to the testing data. So then it can perform better. So that is the general idea. So if I just apply this idea, right? So let's say let's look at a target uh, test sentence. So I'm sick of looking at a com computer screen. So this the emotion is discussed. So I use it is content as a query then to retrieve the most similar tweets. So you can see, the, uh, I get this uh, top two, right? So, so now you can see that their content might be similar. However, the labels are different, right? So that is why, you know, if I just apply the content similarity and then I ignore the label part, then which might be a disaster. So that is why uh, content similarity is not sufficient. So then what do I do? So again, I give you an overview here. So first, we have the content similarity, then I have the label simla similarity. And then I added one more thing, which is uncertainty. And I will start explaining what, what do I mean by uncertainty here. So first, uh, let's look at uh, content sim uh, similarity. So I use two vectors to represent the, the, the so this is uh, the upper sc uh, script S means the, 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 the tweet, and this is a target domain, uh, t upper script T stands for target domain sentence, right? So I use uh, vectors to represent a tweet and the target domain uh, sentence. And then, so this is the standard, you know, cosine similarity, uh, uh, you know, computation to calculate the similarity. So now the question is, how do I use vectors to represent, you know, uh, this, this, uh, the, the tweet and the target domain uh, sentence, right? So the way I do that is because I want to the the, the tweet and the target domain test, uh, you know, when they sh uh, when they have a high similarity, when important words overlap. Okay, so that is why I want to upweight the important words. So for the source domain tweet, I use the conditional probability of uh, of the, 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 the emotion label given the word. So let's say for emotion joy, happy would be a very good feature, right? So that is why you have a you know, higher weight. So that is for the source instance. For the target test instance, because I don't know what is the label, right? So I cannot apply this condition probability because I don't know what is the label like. So instead I apply the IDF because it's just one, uh, you know, one sentence or one tweet. That is why I just assume you know, TF part would be one. So that is the assumption. So then that is how I calculate the content similarity part. So now let's move, move towards the label similarity part. For the label similarity, so again, because this is a, the first uh, you know, sentence, because it's a target domain test sentence. So actually, I don't know if this label is discussed, right? 
So if I notice the label is discussed, then I can compare whether discuss is the same as angle, right? So that is very easy. But I don't know it. If I don't know it, then I basically cast the problem to how likely we are this sentence express the emotion angle, right? So if I want to know their label similarity, instead of asking, okay, what is the how likely will this guy express discuss? I say, okay, what is the chance this guy will express angle? Right? So I cast I change the problem a little bit. So now I just I pretend that for this uh, sentence, it is label is anger. And then I apply the consistency factor to check whether the, the, label, uh, the label anger is consistent with the content or not. Right? If it's consistent, then probably there's a higher chance that you know, uh, this guy expresses the emotion anger. So that is the idea. So similarly, uh, I just use the uh, get the top supporting features for emotion anger. So I get two probabilities. Uh, then I get the top supporting features for any emotion other than anger. I get two more probabilities. And then I use the margin to estimate the consistency. So in this case, you can see that actually uh, there is, a, let me see, right. Actually there is a very strong supporting uh, feature for emotion disgust, right? So in that case, you can see the, the, the consistency factor is, uh, is, is, uh, is negative. So what does this mean is that the chance of these two, these two uh, the tweet and the sentence having the same label would be much less. So that is what I mean by label similarity. So now once we have the content similarity, we have the label similarity, right? Why do I want to add uncertainty? And what do I mean by uncertainty? So let's look at two sentences. Uh, the first one is the second day I go in and I be so paranoid. And the second one is we are total awesome, right? So for the first one, it is label is fear. So I apply the classifier. The, the classifier t tells me that, okay, uh, it, it should be uh, sadness and with a confidence of uh, you know very small confidence. For the second one, uh, it predicts okay it should be joy and the classifier this time is very confident. Okay, so by contrasting these two examples, so what we will find out is that usually the more confident the classifier is, the more likely the prediction is correct. For this one, because the classifier is 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 not uh, confident at all, what does this means? Classifier is saying okay. It has you know 23% chance of expressing uh, fear. It has 22% chance of expressing joy. It has you know 21% of expressing something. So all these probabilities are so similar. So that is why the classifier is very confused. It just doesn't know what to do, right? So that is why in if if it has a very high confidence, then the less focus we should give to this sentence because it, if it gives very high confidence, usually in the prediction you know has a higher chance of being correct. So instead, we should pay more attention to cases where the classifier is not confident. So then, that is why uh, I define the uncertainty as you know, one minus the, this confidence. So you can see for the first one, it is uncertainty would be you know, very high. For the second one, the uncertainty would be you know, very, very low. Right? So, in the, so once we have the uncertainty, right? so now when we plug in the content similarity, label similarity, and uncertainty together, so what we are looking for would be, we're looking for selecting the source instances that share the high content similarity and high label similarity with the target domain test instances that the classifier C is most uncertain about. Right? So basically, we are giving a, a higher, uh, giving more focus to these, uh, to these uh, test instances that the classifier is uncertain about. So that is why when we put these three things together, that is, that is what I mean. Right? So that is the, the similarity. We are not just looking at the similarity to any test instance in target domain. I'm just looking at the sim, uh, you know, similar tweets that are similar to these uncertain uh, in, uh, sentences in the target domain. So that is the idea. So now I just explained what is a similarity. So now again, uh, let's revisit informativeness, right? So the first one is consistency. So a tweet is informative when it is label is consistent with it is content. Uh, and it contains a discriminative feature that is uh, infrequent or Underpresented in a target domain training data, and it is similar to a target domain test instance, uh, and this test instance cannot be predicted by the classifier C with high confidence. So that is what I mean by you know uh, informativeness. So, so, the, so the difference between the two things: is consistency is internal to a tweet, or similarity is across source and target. Yes, 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 yes. So within uh, like diversity, it's possible that there is some noise present, and so you know there's some word which is very very infrequent. But it seems I don't know if it's intuitive that you would give this weight the same weight as you would give to say consistency. 
Because uh, right now all these factors have equal importance in the measure of informativeness. Right. So for the diversity, I'm uh, I'm not just looking at say you know which one is the so. I'm looking for a discriminative feature that is infrequent. I'm not looking at just the infrequent. So basically, among all these features, right, I want to say, OK, which feature is actually in, uh, plays the dominant role in expressing certain emotion? So I already know that it is a good feature. But I just want to know, you know whether this, good, this discriminative feature, whether it is infrequent in a target domain or not. So right. Mm -hmm. So why do you use the multiplication here? So uh, Dr. Chen is asking me, uh, why do I use uh, mu multiplication uh, instead of other things? So, um, so th the the reason why I use multiplication is because um, uh, uh, so the re so the re so the reason is uh, uh, when it is multiplication, right? So it, let's say if one factor drops a lot, and then it will dramatically you know affect this score. So basically, this will achieve a high value when each component is high. So versus the, if, if it's plus, then it wouldn't affect it that much. So if I had to, to, to simplify this problem, so let's say if I have just two factors, right? So, so say for, for the, if I just plus them, so if I, when both of them are one, right? So one plus one would be two, and one uh, multiplied by one, that would be one, two. Okay, so then however, let's say uh, if, if, uh, if one f drops from one to uh, 0 0.1, right? So then if I just plus them together, that would be uh, 1.1. If it's a multiply, so you can see it is 0 0.1 multiplied by 1. It becomes a 0 0.1. So you can see it dramatically uh, decreased the value. Because each three components are you know, important. That is why. Did, did you try other methods just simply, for example, the, the addition, maybe results <laughs> the same? Yes, uh, but I didn't try. I just, I just yeah. uh, thought about it. But yes, it's a, it's a good idea. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to, to try it out. OK, uh, so because our approach is based on the consistency, diversity, and similarity, so that is why uh, it is uh, named as a CDS. OK, so now uh, here are the baseline approaches. We use all the, you know, so, uh, we use only the source domain data for training. Uh, we use uh, the only uh, target domain data for training. And uh, we train a source classifier uh, on the source domain data and use the, and we apply this classifier to the target domain uh, testing uh, instances. And then we get some pro probability outputs. And then use these outputs as uh, addi additional features. And the bottom two are state of the R2 approaches. So because of the time limit, so I won't go uh, deep into the, the details. So for specific experiment setting, uh, I tried uh, for different features, I tried unigrams, bigrams, and uh, unigram and bigrams. So uh, unigrams performs uh, the best. So that's why I applied unigrams. For the classifier, I applied logistic regression because one, it is very fast, and second, uh, it, pro it supports the probability output, so which was used to uh, calculate the uncertainty part. Uh, I applied the five-fold cross-validation on the target domain uh, data set, so the four-fold uh, were used for training, and the remaining four were used for testing. And to estimate the condition probability, I used the uh, add 0 0.5 uh, uh, smoothing here. So now let's look at the results. So the first column is we have uh, four different uh, data sets. Uh, then the last column would be the average uh, you know, value across four different data sets. So we have uh, you know, different uh, baseline approaches here. So CDS is our proposed approach. Hey, what are the EXPI, by the way? Uh, experience, experience data set. So if you look at the last uh, row here, right? so you can see that the proposed uh, you know, CDS approach performs uh, better than the remaining uh, baseline approaches. So if we look at specific uh, percentage uh, gain here, so if we compare CDS and uh, versus the use only the target domain uh, uh, training data, so you can see these are the you know, percent percentage gain here. On average, the percentage gain is uh, 15%. So for the ferry, ferry, the percentage gain is the smallest because you know, twist and ferry tails, you know, they, they don't share that uh, similarity. So that is why the uh, percentage gain is the smallest here. And, uh, so specifically, uh, previously I talked about uh, why do I want to uh, you know, select from misclassified tweets, right? So here I tried different options. So CDS is a pr uh, our pr proposed approach. So select tweets from uh, uh, misclassified tweets. We have the CDS O. So O is we select from all the source tweets, right? And CDS correct. Select tweets from, uh, from the source tweet that can be uh, correctly 
classified by C. Okay, so if you compare CDS, CDSO, CDS correct. So basically, CDS the input to the CDSO would be the superset of the of the CDS and CDS correct. I had another question about the informative tweets. Uh, was there a threshold, like the value above which you then chose it as informative, like once you computed the problem? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I, I chose some uh, threshold for that. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Uh, so for oh, there is one more remaining, which is the CD part. So the CD basically I remove the similarity factor from uh, from CDS. So that is uh, one more approach. So here you can. If you look at the four different data sets, uh, block, diary, experience, and ferry, so the x-axis would be the iteration number. So we keep you know, running uh, more and more iterations until you know, it stops. Uh, so the y-axis would be the micro-average F1 score. So first, among all these uh, you know, different uh, selection strategies, CDS improves the F1s in a fast way. So CDS is the, is the red line here, right? So you can see CDS improves in the fastest way here. So here, you know, it improves very fast. So if we compa uh, compare CD and which is the green line versus the CDS, so you can see that uh, CDS improves faster than the CD because with the S part, right, S, S is the similarity, we are focusing on the, the test instances that the classifier is uncertain about. So we were very focused, right, trying to improve the performance. So that is why, you know, compare CDS and CD, it improves it you know, much faster. So if we compare CDSO and CDS, so remember the input to CDSO, right, is the is a superset of the input to CDS. So because of this, eventually, uh, if you look at the, the red line, which is a CDS, and the blue one, which is a CDSO, so eventually their performance their performances are similar, right? So here, here, so here, and here, here, and here, they are similar because the CD, the input to CDSO is a superset of the input to uh, CDS. But however, because it contains much more, you know, tweets, right? So it's not that focused. That is why it takes much more iterations to be finished, right? The, the, the blue one compared with the, the red one. So you can see the red one fin finishes, you know, much earlier compared with the blue one. And uh, so why I didn't select from only the, the, correctly, um, or the correctly classified one. So look at the, the blue one here, right? So you can see this one stands for, you know, CDS correct. So this one performs the worst among all these, you know, Strategies. So that is. What is the stopping criteria for the number of iterations? Oh yes, yes. So basically, I have a, I have a set up a threshold for that, and I have done some experiment to show that how does the the this uh, threshold you know play a role in terms of the the results. But it just I I couldn't finish everything, so that is why I just selectively presented some results here. Yeah, but I, I can show you. It, uh, so I I uh, experiment the. The influence of parameters. So, so one would be the the threshold. So uh, when when will it stop? And uh, a different one would be because each time I need to select some informative tweets from the source domain, right? But you know how big, how many tweets should I select? So I set I set that as uh, proportional to the size of the target domain training data. So I try to say five percent, ten percent. I keep increasing until fifty percent. You know how does that uh, change the the result? So yeah. If you, if you look at the lecture, for example, second chart. Performance goes up to the peak and then it decreases. Yeah, so because this iterative approach right, is very difficult to say, you just want to stop right at the, the peak. That is, if you look at across different data, if for everything, right, if just uh, stop at the, the peak, then I think that would be suspicious. <laughs> right, so, okay, so, so in summary, um, so I've shown that you know, we can glean people's emotions uh, using machine learning techniques from uh, text. And I've also shown that we can automatically create a large amount of uh, self labeled data from uh, social media. And uh, for the domain adaptation for emotion identification, uh, so we can select informative tweets to improve the uh, emotion identification. And uh, it is more beneficial to select, mis select informative tweets from uh, misclassified tweets. And we define informativeness as uh, the multiplication of three factors. Um, so, um, three factors, consistency, diversity, and uh, similarity. So, uh, I have 
publish some papers. <laughs> uh, and uh, I have uh, two patents, and uh, uh, you know, uh, I collaborate with the lab members. So we submit uh, one proposal. Hopefully, you will be uh, excited. That is what my advisor has been talking in the past one month. So he, he was very proud of me. Uh, I'm right, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, uh, so special thanks, thanks to uh, funding agencies, uh, Air Force uh, Research Labs, and uh, NSF. Uh, so, um, we should put explicit socks funding. Okay, okay, okay. We should listen to the boss. So, uh, but I'm about to graduate. So, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> So a uh, spe very special set thanks to uh, my advisors and uh, committee members, uh, you know, both people who are uh, committee members who are here or who are joining remotely. Uh, so since, since this is a, you know, a presentation about emotions, right? So that's why I tried my best to, you know, to, uh, you know, invoke uh, some positive emotions out of you. So hopefully I didn't fail. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, I will so start thanking uh, you know, uh, my company members, right? So the first one is, uh, uh, so I dare my advisor not to laugh when he looks at uh, this slide. Uh, so the f I would like to thank my uh, uh, advisor. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so even when he was a kid, you know, you know, he's gonna be a boss sometime, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so, so special thanks to Facebook. I got I got this one. So, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I uh, yeah I learned a lot from uh, from him. Uh, you know, uh, so yeah, so I think it's a uh, it's a uh, you know because of him, you know, I I was able to meet you know the rest of the committee members and all you guys, and especially you know my wife. So uh, without my wife, I don't think I can finish my PhD. That is for sure. So yeah. <clears throat> So, okay. So the next one. Uh, so now you guys have high expectation, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the next one I will uh, thank uh, Dr. Prasad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this one was not from Facebook. I just hacked your email. So, <laughs> no, this uh, special thanks to uh, a promote. So yeah, yeah. So that's why I got the picture. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah. Dr. Uh, you know, has been always been very, you know, supportive uh, for my work. So every time when I after I, you know meet him, I feel I'm a, you know, happier person. So yeah. <clears throat> uh, so now you guys have a higher <laughs> expectation, but I have to fail you guys. And I'll explain why. So I would thank uh, Dr. K K Chen. I guys, I tried three hours trying going through all the Facebook and even the Chinese Facebook. I was not able to find his, uh, you know, photos. Yeah, he's a person who works on you know privacy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so guys, I really tried. Then Lu Lu Sali step in and say, okay, maybe let me try. I said, okay, stop. I tried the Chinese uh, Twitter, Chinese Facebook. So you know, uh, I just couldn't do it. So I'm sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> so I'd like to uh, thank uh, Kevin Hess from uh, Microsoft. So this is uh, Kevin. So yeah, uh, I, I I also learned a lot from uh, Kevin, although I just interacted with him, you know, shortly during my internship. So um, so he said, he so he will say something that uh, that that can benefit a lot uh, to you. So one thing I still remember is uh, he once he told me, uh, uh, Wimbo, uh, less PowerPoint, more Eclipse. So <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, sorry, I I, I spent like. Uh, Past two weeks, just uh, exclusive on PowerPoint. So I apologize, Kevin. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so, uh, okay, so, uh, so Kevin also said something because at that time we were working on the MapReduce, you know, big data. So, um, so he said, Wimbo, if you're working on big data, don't always start with big data because, you know, it takes a long time to find out, okay, you made a mistake. Then you, you waited for three hours to get the result and it was wrong. So it's better to start, say, you know, thousands of uh, data points and, you know, a little bit more. So in that case, you can save, save some time. So I always fo follow this after my internship, and it really helped me a lot. So, uh, <clears throat> so <laughs> you guys don't give me too much pressure. <laughs> okay, so the last one, I would, do, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ramakant uh, Kavluru. <laughs> so Rama, you, look, uh, you looked much cuter when you were young. So, <laughs> <laughs> so. So uh, special thanks to uh, Facebook again. So this was the only uh, photo when Rama was young. So and he posted on Facebook. So I just uh, took it. So 
And uh, I would also like to thank all the Noesis members, you know, the, the existing, the current ones and the, the previous ones. So, and I would, I would like to uh, especially thank my uh, mentor, Christopher Thomas. So, um, yeah, so he spent uh, countless hours with me trying to explain to me, you know, uh, how to, uh, how to uh, solve a research problem. And at that time, I knew nothing about uh, research, right? So I still remember the first time he showed me, he explained to me what is stemming to me. So at that time, I was shocked. I thought, oh, this guy is so genius. <laughs> he, he knows what is stemming. That, that was the first time I heard about it. So then later, I heard more and more things you know, uh, from him. So I really uh, learned a lot uh, from him. So yeah. Uh, so, uh, so do you have any questions? I'll take some water. Yes, please. For, uh, for one tweet, you said uh, you consider this, and one tweet may have two emotions simultaneously. Yes. Yeah. And for solving this, you use consistency. Yes. Yeah. How, how you apply consistency in, in a very short way to explain this? Because I didn't get your idea how, the, how it can be grouped into uh, one joy. One joy or excitement at the same time. So if a tweet so if a tweet is inconsistent, right? That is because it it conveys two types of emotions. So I, I iterate through all these words and then trying to see, you know, say okay, this word has a very high probability indicating joy, and maybe the next word has a very high probability indicating, uh, you know, a different emotion. So in that case, so if I iterate through all these uh, words and uh, all of them just indicate one emotion, right? In that case, I know that okay, it is consistent. But however, if if there is a you know, um, the one word indicating you know one emotion, the other word indicate a to totally different emotion. So in that case, I know that there'll be two emotions. It, there'll be mixed emotions. So basically, the, the gap right would be the the condition probability of indicating different emotions. So if the gap is very big, which means one emotion is dominant. If the gap is very small, then probably I have two you know, uh, emotion dominant at the same time. So that is the idea. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, promote. Slide 48. So you said that linear features go to bed. Yes. So I assume that this is the evaluation for a blonde, right? Uh, f actually, I tried for all of them. OK. On your slide uh, 19, you said uh, the evaluations were better for bigram. Mm -hmm. And trigram, it reduced. Right? Yes. So is there any explanation why yes, these yes. different inconsistencies, at least in my mind, mm -hmm. seem consistent? Right. So the reason why, uh, the reason why it is uh, it is uh, it is different is because for the target domains, right? Uh, you notice that uh, in this case, most of them they are very small. So that is why when I try, so so when you keep adding more features, right? We are trying to what do you say? Um, we started increasing the, the, the problem of the curse of dimension, dim curse of high, uh, the, the high dimensions, right, right. So that is why if the data set is <coughs> relatively small, then you know if we add more features, then you know the results gets worse. So that is the reason. Okay. I'm mean, just wondering, so you, why, didn't you, why didn't you apply those knowledge features here as well when you were doing the domain transfer? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think this is, yeah, this is a good idea. Uh, the reason why I didn't to try is because I just want to start simple. You know, I don't want to bring too many uh, factors, then it will be uh, complicated. But say, now I have this one, then probably I can try uh, in the knowledge features, then see what happens next. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, this is Rama. So um, I um, really enjoyed your presentation on the information disaster. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think you covered it in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. I also thought that this idea, this whole idea that you came up with the pandemic was very clever. Mm -hmm. uh, but now it is also intuitive and simple. Mm -hmm. um, so can you go to slide 53? 53. <laughs> So um, yeah, this, so that being said, um, so um, the serious approach that it's, it's kind of giving you, uh, I guess, uh, in a way what we would call convergence. Um, right. In 
and fewer iterations. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, um, but why does this this thing stop kind of end with? Like what I mean by that is, why are the red, uh, why was the red one not extended to iterations rather than let's say 25 or 30, wherever it stopped? You're, you're just not showing it to us or is it decreasing after that? Oh, uh, okay, right. Uh, so Rama, um, so, <clears throat> so the reason why it stopped is because, uh, uh, because I have a predefined uh, threshold for informativeness. And uh, if, uh, say, uh, and I also, um, so for each iteration, um, I need to select, say, uh, so let's say I, I select uh, 100 informative tweets, right? And uh, so, so whose uh, who's informativeness is above the threshold. And if I'm not able to do that, then the bootstrapping will stop. So that is why, you know, the, the reason why the, the, the red one uh, stopped because, you know, it cannot find sufficient uh, informative tweets. Then it will stop right there. So that is the reason. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. So another thing is then, um, there seems to be like hills and valleys in this, how this thing is progressing. So do you have a strategy of when we should really stop getting more informative tweets and just say that, okay, this is like probably the best my product. Oh yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. This is so. Yeah. So, um, so, so basically, you are saying that uh, what is the you know best uh, strategy for if we have a different uh, target domain? So I think this is a uh, because even for the CDS red graphs, right? It's they're going up and down uh, before you start actually progressing. Right. 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 So, so obviously, like there are these hills and valleys where uh, after a few vibrations, we're getting like really the maximum. And then that is kind of going down in the next iteration and probably coming up again. So where do we start? How many iterations do we do? Okay, so right now uh, the way I control, uh, you know, the iteration is by I have uh, some predefined uh, threshold, and uh, actually I experimented with the, uh, you know, the threshold and see uh, what is the range for the threat. So you know, uh, how does the the different thresholds affect uh, the result? So um, I forgot the exact, but basically there's a range. So if, if it is within that range, then the, you know, the performance would be uh, similar. If it is out of the range, then it starts uh, decreasing. Because if you think about the, in, uh, the informativeness, right, the higher the score, then which means we are raising the bar very high. If the bar is very high, then we are selecting less and less number of in informativeness, right? At the same time, is, is the bar, if it is too low, then it means we are selecting everything. Then it would be, so there should be some you know, balance. So for today's uh, presentation, because I was not sure whether I can you know, finish on time, so that is why uh, I took it out. But in the paper, you know, I have the diagram sh uh, showing, uh, plot showing that, you know, how does that threshold uh, affect the, the results? So that is for one thing. And I also have a, 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 a plot showing uh, how, so for every iteration, uh, what is the, how should I choose? You know, how many tweets should I select? Uh, informative tweets sh should I select to add to the uh, target domain training data? So, you know, what, does the number of uh, uh, informative tweets play a role, uh, you know, uh, in the performance or not? So. Okay. So, yeah, I have one question. So, CTS here is basically for you to select the uh, training instance from the source domain, right? Yes. So how do you finally combine and you test the different the strategy here? Just um, merge it. Oh, just merge, just merge. Right, right. I think it is maybe interesting to test other strategy. Go, go back and back. Ah, that. I see, I see. Yeah. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be interesting, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, That's like this one, right? This one, right? Yeah, you combine the the the, 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 yeah. Right, right, yeah, I agree, yes, yes. Because now I'm just, say, treating them uh, equally, right? Then I yeah. can get this result. Right. So what if I emphasize more on the target domain, uh, uh, right, right, right. Give, assign them high ways? The same method as you use for All oh, right, 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 yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. This is a very good observation, right? Yeah, then you can compare, you know, the result more impressive. Yes, 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 yeah. So basically, what Dr. Chen is saying, so in my approach, I just you know, uh, select the tweets and then add them into the target domain uh, training data. So I'm not, so I'm basically treating the, the, the tweet 
and the target domain uh, training instance as equal weights. So all of them have a uh, weights of one. But in, the, in this baseline approach, right, so what does this do is it emphasizes, um, keep more uh, emphasis on the target domain uh, test, uh, target domain training instance, so assigns higher weights. Because eventually we're going to test it on the target domain data, right? So Doc Chen is suggesting, hey, what if, say, once I select the informative tweets, right, I start increasing the weights of the target domain training instances. So in that case, probably I can even boost the, the result. So. so, But we are doing that, right? I mean, the target domain uh, data is kind of getting replicated. If, ah, if I see. The, see, when, as in the process of your iterations, right, mm -hmm. suppose the the old target domain correct instance gets misclassified, you right. add additional copies. Yes, and yes. so you are waiting uh, the target domain uh, tweets or adding additional copies of target domain uh, uh, tweets. So in some sense, you are catering to that. Mm. No, I mean, the, you know, the final step you didn't describe here, actually. Oh, the final, okay, 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 I After see. After you select additional instance from source domain, then what you do? Yeah, you're doing it. Yeah. Oh, the, the final step, I just merge them together, yes. Right. So I, what Dr. Chen is suggesting is? The final step is just merging, not overweighting the target domain. Yeah, but, but overall the effect is to get uh, extra weight for target domain. That's domain. just for selecting the additional uh, instance from the source domain. So the whole procedure we discussed just to use to select the additional instance to not to generate the final uh, final part. I think the, the confusion here is because there is one piece that, that I didn't present because it's a little bit complicated. So that is why you know I probably we can discuss later. Yeah? There, there's one piece that I you know I, I didn't present. I was not sure about the, the timing, so you know. Just want to you know throw the the, the, the the overall idea, then you know, yeah. So that was the reason. Yeah, just quick question. Can we keep backup slides to do that? Like, uh, what if uh, instead of uh, doing this approach of uh, you know uh, specifically trying to select informative tweets, what if we would have let the uh, learning algorithm itself identify? So if we would have given the stances of uh, our source and the targets and apply in the boost, like a boosting based methods, which eventually try to go iterative, try to you know deviate the instances of misclassified tweets, and then keep learning <coughs> on it, right? Mm -hmm. So like, did you uh, have also thought on that, that why that wasn't the right, uh, right or appropriate way compared to what we are approaching here? Uh, so you are saying that uh, why not try IDA boost? It's like we are boosting based in mm -hmm. boosting method, right? Eventually you're also reading the things and then effectively keep trying to use this classified way. So. Um, so okay, I'm not entirely sure uh, what do you mean by applying boosting because it's a supervised classifier, right? So are you saying I apply the ADA boost to the target domain training some data? Some instances you have, right? So some instances you have for targets, some, and you have some instances for source, right? So if you give all these instances together to a boosting-based method, and it tries to learn from the instances space itself, that's what, what I mean. So, so, so it's trying to learn on its own, and another alternative is you are using your own approach, right? So mm -hmm. what I'm saying is, if we take I think training on the merge of the source data yes, and the yes, target data. Yes, yes, because ultimately that's what you are doing. Like that, that's what I'm saying, right? So you have that merge data, and then our algorithm is trying to learn. So I was thinking, if what if we would have just applied the boost? Thing so are you saying, uh, is it at the very beginning I just merged the source domain data, the tweets, yes. and the target domain training data, or is it say, at the very end once not, I, I was able end, to? Not at the end. I do first. Mm. So let me see. Uh, yeah, yeah. So okay. Yeah. So I actually I, I tried that. Okay. Okay. So what I tried is I just merged the source the source domain data and target domain training data. I didn't apply IDA boost specifically, but I tried uh, other classifiers. It, they perform worse. The reason is uh, uh, the reason why. I'm trying to select, you know, identify the informative tweets, right? It's because not every tweet is useful in this case. So if I add some, you know, um, some noisy tweets, you know, into the training data, it actually decreases the performance. So that is why, um, that is why I'm trying to not using all the tweets. Instead, I'm selecting 
a few very good ones, then add it for training purpose. So, and I yeah. think the other intuition, the reason behind that was just a large, very large training data set, right? You want to? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that I purchased a lot of snacks and it worked today. So, <laughs> you guys. <laughs> Why did it work? Uh, uh, remember the the girl getting married. The, the girl. That is why you're asking me so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the the uh, the question is that uh, you know look at some of these techniques. Uh, they perform very poorly on some data, like on diary or ferry. And on the other hand, CBS at the end ends up being all in the 60s percent, with the exception of blog, which does you know better. But then otherwise, it's all getting into. Um, so, so there's some sort of, even though the diversity of this data set is, there's a significant diversity of the data set, mm -hmm. there's something you are doing that brings, um, uh, you know, all of them it's at, at a decent level on you know two thirds of them happen to be kind of correctly done right mm -hmm. but maybe one in three mm -hmm. um, so what can you claim mm. what I can claim would be um, it is uh, useful to you know uh, it's beneficial to select the informative tweets out of the misclassified uh, tweets right mm -hmm. so and uh, and I decompose you know uh, informativeness into three different factors uh, uh, what is what's that no, that's fine this right. cds thing you have. right cds right, right. the point is uh, given that uh, all of these are beneficiaries indirectly of uh, you know we have been transfer learning right mm -hmm. so all of these are beneficiaries of um, learning that happened with the twitter data which is a large data set yes yes that um, there is good coverage, so there's enough in that to bring any type of data you give to a decent level. Yes. At the same time, they're not great. I mean, I don't know, would you argue 60s as a good uh, outcome? I mean, yes, compared Can't to other it. techniques, is improving, fine, that's right. Good. But, but in absolute measure, I think that the, um, uh, you know, uh, results for Twitter itself is better than any one of these, right? Right. Uh, so obviously, it appears that maybe that is your upper limit, and perhaps even the target. Mm -hmm. The best you can possibly get is because of it. you can transfer only what you have. If you don't yes. have good knowledge, you're going to transfer, right? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Unless you figure out very really uniquely that that particular uh, target data set on type has something unique that Twitter does not have. But in terms of language and the term, words used in emotions, and especially if the one gram or two grams are working very well, then the distinction between the type of representation is not all really big because you'll find one gram or two gram in any type of data, it doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. So, so um, in some sense, if those are the things that lead to a high performance, and in your case, you know, two grams did well, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to transfer to anything because every other data set will have two gram available, one gram available if that can be transferred. Mm -hmm. The challenge is where, how, what, what can you do to go above this? How can I get this in 80 percent, uh, you know, 0.8 and kind of above, kind of stuff. If, if you go by to just pure classification, mm -hmm. basic classification of text, right, mm -hmm. of news, let's say, mm -hmm. then, you, then people claim to get, they have gotten 90 percent plus. Mm -hmm. In the classifier accuracy, mm -hmm. here we are talking about significantly lower ones. Right. Uh, so, if you uh, if we compare the emotion, you know, classification versus uh, text classification, right? So, I think it's uh, not a uh, you know it's not a fair comparison. So, if we compare emotion identification uh, classification versus uh, sentiment classification, right? So, I think uh, sentiment classification, you know, right now, binary classification. 85 percent, right? So, so if you think about it, you know, sentiment is just a binary classification, right? So that is the the best, uh, you know, state of that uh, 
that's why I'm not you're just talking about okay, okay, okay. classification. Okay, okay. You know, you're just talking you know, about how to further yeah, go further yeah, improve yeah, it. Traditional classif text, text classification, you have taxonomy, so you will have <coughs> twenty you know nodes in the taxonomy or a hundred nodes in the taxonomy. Right, right, right. And uh, suitably, you know, the last set data set gives you very good. <laughs> uh, if I will classify whether this is a content related to finance, this is content related to news, this is content related to sports, that classification is very high. Right, right, right. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah. So, so in the, I think the uh, Tali tal algorithms, or semantics algorithms, very very uh, easy to mm -hmm. So, so, but here these are much lower. And yes, you know, you can argue that emotion is a harder problem. Right. I don't think that the fact that you have seven emotion, emotion or fifteen emotion is a big deal. Given the number of size of data, you know the size data set you have is in Twitter. That's my argument. It's just uh, that um, the variability, the expressions, the variety of way the people use it is more diverse. Um, and in fact, the agreement would be lower. Ah uh, yes. In terms of right, agreement, right. will itself be lower here. Yeah. And the example I was earlier giving in terms of. Um, you know whether that particular thing would be anger, you know, anger no, versus, sadness, uh, right. you know, uh, so people who you know look at it differently. In fact, same term, they so it's an ambiguity of the terms. Yes, yes. And when you when you when you are one gram and two grams are doing very well, then the ambiguity of that is pretty high. Yes. Would you have gone for uh, some in a more targeted way, higher and gra you know gra higher and grams, or um, more like phrase extractions, and then use of them in particular mm -hmm. where they are less amenable to ambiguity mm -hmm. compared to one gram or two grams. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, what, what information we have in one gram? Two, nothing, not much. Mm -hmm. So if you go with more information rich um, nuggets, uh, information rich uh, you know, core components mm -hmm. of text on which you are basing your classification, mm -hmm. it could, you know, the question is could you go higher there? Yeah, uh, yeah. This uh, so basically, uh, Doc Stress is asking. Uh, so right now, you know, you know, on average, sixty-six percent. You know, this is the you know the the result we can get. Right? How can we perform uh, better? Um, so, I think so. Uh, from my observation, so let's say um, from the Twitter data, you know, two person describe similar situations. You know, the phone is about to run out of battery. You know, some person will put you know hashtag sadness. Some person will say hashtag anger. Right. So in that case, I think maybe some persons, you know, they are more prone to being uh, irritated, right? So in that case, if we can introduce some personalized uh, features, so then we can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I have a thought here. So so suppose instead of uh, requiring a single label for a tweet, mm -hmm. why not think of a vector of Good that idea. adds up to one, and and then that will probably reflect the ambiguity, and mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you have. Let's say two predominant emotion. It might say 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and if it's only one, it may be 0.9, and then 0 0.1 distributed across, and and that might actually yeah. give you a better uh, right, right. reflection of what's going on. So yes, yes, yes. And uh, Doctor said about the phrases, extracting phrases or entities, so making sure that it's more semantically meaningful, right? Uh, working on user modeling and tweet recommendation, it's pretty surprising that unigrams do very well, just EF idea, and having unigrams does really well on tweets, that is very surprising, so uh, much better than entities or any kind of uh, LDA, there are papers which have compared LDA and other classification techniques even machine learning, and just EF idea is doing pretty well, so that... I wouldn't give up, uh, and maybe, maybe that is it, but uh, still I, I'm finding it a little bit hard to uh, say that in the end, when all the things are considered, enough of the domain model considered. For example, I didn't make much issue here, but uh, clearly the um, earlier uh, result that he has in terms of uh, the value of use of knowledge pay is pretty disappointing. It only added 0 0.02% improvement, right? Huh? That's just nothing. It's a waste of time, right? And even nobody would use knowledge base. But I do believe that, uh, I don't think that this was uh, a good enough knowledge that was applied here. The most more re re relevant knowledge was applied here, knowledge was compressive enough, it was applied contextually enough. There are many, many issues in terms of the knowledge base actually used, in my view, uh, in this one was rather not that satisfying. It was applied, in, it, it may be that, that 
the straight forward direct uh, use of knowledge does not get good improvement and in that sense he, he got that result and so be it and that's how I left it but I think that there could be a lot more that could be done to, to think about you know because our brain applies the knowledge in a very uh, you know sophisticated way it's not the simplistic thing that we have right but it wasn't a very specific question here it was just identifying these emotions yeah if it was a domain like say for you know customers from some IMDb right. or whatever sort right, of right, right. product, that would make a big difference. Let me, yeah. let me pose it another though, point, uh, you know. Uh, oh, no, sorry, before, uh, so one, one thing is, I, I think we can add more uh, contextual, uh, you know, information. So <clears throat> remember uh, our cursing paper, right? So basically, usually if you are, you know, in the beginning of the day, you are, you are being more, less, less prone to being irritated, you know. If it's close to towards the night, then you will be probably get, get angry, you know, easily, right? So we can plug this you know, time, location, this contextual information. So in that case, a personalized feature. So in that case, we can we can do better. See, there's other possibility, or, and I may be wrong here, so correct me if I'm wrong. Given that, given, you know, exactly the same text, people would have this different, uh, you know, uh, they will classify differently. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can achieve yeah. very high anyway. How is that refactored in? See, your, your target cannot be, you know, if you, if you take, human orientators and try to get agreement, uh, that itself is not ever going to yes. be one. Yes, yes. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hence the target just can't be there. The question is, are you, uh, it would be a little bit ideal, you provided human annotator, uh, you know, uh, you gold standard uh, thing, to say my target cannot be one, target is 0 0.8, 0 0.75. Yeah, good I idea. remember uh, that uh, we were applying, um, you know, classification and knowledge based techniques to uh, finding the text in a textbook that is relevant to a question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? So that was the uh, objective. Mm -hmm. And uh, we took the so called expert, meaning teachers or who actually, people who actually use that textbook for teaching that 8th uh, grade class. I see. And their agreement between the, the two of them was only for 62%. Right? So how are you going to expect uh, any machines to come up with 65% uh, agreement? Right? But it is so critical for us to record that the agreement between the humans, the best case analysis here is 62%. So my target is 62%, not one, one that... Yes, yes. You yeah. know, it's just not there. That needs to be presented. If you present that, this, this is look, potentially look exceptionally good. I don't know. But much better than what you might say. It is really, I said, the statement I made earlier is wrong, in my view. When I said, oh, two in three are correctly classified. No, that's not the correct uh, thing. Mm -hmm. In reality, two in three is respect to what? With respect to human agreement, <coughs> it's only 75% uh, at the best, then it is more than two in three. Yeah? So the reference yeah, point yeah. is not one. Yeah, I, I get your point. I think right. that's, that's where you're going to get. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, tomorrow, show up. Uh, uh, any, uh, all of you guys are welcome if you choose to at 6:30. If you don't know where, ask anybody else. Right? And, uh, the harassment proposal that these guys worked on uh, is currently officially recommended. It's not awarded, but I think we can celebrate that. You know, as, <laughs> as, as is Hazar C. So there are two currently recommended. A third is being recommended right now as we speak, but it's not yet recommended officially on the past name. Alright guys, we'll see you then the committee is in